Hey everybody, Adam Savage in my cave with a show and tell that is an absolute blast from my past. Um, in the early 90s, when I first moved to San Francisco, um, I got a lot of work in the theater industry. I worked for a lot of small theaters in San Francisco. And if you were around at that time, I'm gonna name a few of them. Theater Rhinoceros, Project Arto, the Eureka Theater, Life on the Water Theater. Um, I worked and rigged in so many of those houses and so many more. And then after a couple of years, uh, I discovered San Francisco, like many big cities, has, you know, it's funny, I don't know if cities have this anymore, but there used to be basically a book you could buy that was everyone who worked in the film industry. And it was called The Real Directory, R-E-E-L for obvious reasons. And the real directory was where you went and looked for a gaffer or a grip or a production designer. And everybody in film had a real directory. And more importantly, everyone in film had their name in the real directory. And it was like, it was not expensive, 30 bucks a year or something to put yourself in there as like, hey, I'm a freelance designer of props and stuff, and stuff like that. And I only ever got three jobs out of putting my name in the real directory. Um, one of them was uh, designing props for a party that was a total disaster. And by disaster, I mean I underbid on that job. It was one of the very first professional jobs I ever built. And when I say I underbid, I mean I, I bid like a tenth of what the thing should have charged. I really, really didn't know. And I got in a lot of trouble and I got in over my head. By trouble, I mean I agreed to build things that I could not deliver and it all worked out fine. The other job that I got from Real Directory, the, the second job that I got, was one of the best theater prop jobs I have ever been given. It was a show happening at one of the Broadway theaters, the SHN or the Golden Gate, and they had a rock and they wanted a fire to be coming out of the rock. I think it was for a production of Anyone Can Whistle, because that sounds like an Anyone Can Whistle prop. Um, and they were like, could you make a fake fire? And I was like, absolutely, I can make a fake fire. And I, look, I just love the idea of the fake fire, which is a fan and a light, and the fan goes on some silk and it looks like a fire. Um, and these people, they were like, can you do this for us by Friday? And it was like Wednesday. And I'm like, absolutely. And they said, we can bring it to you. And I was like, really? And they literally, they brought the rock to me and the type of fire they wanted. I built it all from scratch. And then they picked it up for me and they paid me like 600 bucks, which for me back then, that was like, that was like half of my rent. Um, Stunning job. So from the high to the low, and then the other, the last job I got from the real directory was working at a San Francisco institution called Beach Blanket Babylon. Beach Blanket Babylon ran for, I believe, almost 40 years in San Francisco. When I worked for them in the 90s, they were celebrating their 25th anniversary. Um, and this was a Beach Blanket Babylon for the Uninitiated was a musical comedy review. Lots of drag queens, lots of singers, lots of funny jokes, topical jokes, not funny jokes. Uh, I just mean like, you know, old, old Borscht Belt type of comedy jokes. Um, but it was a fantastically formative job for me. Um, the show lasted 70 minutes long. Uh, there were five backstage positions there's a point to me telling you all this. I'll get to it. Uh, there were five backstage positions, uh, assistant stage manager, stage manager, props, costumes, and spotlight. And I had to learn all of those positions. Each one had 200 plus cues in a 70 minute show. So just to train to be an understudy technician took three months. Um, and it was a a fabulous job because I was an understudy technician. I got paid half salary with full benefits and I didn't have to work for that. If I worked more, I would actually get paid for working. So it was like I was being paid half so salary to be on standby and I got more if I actually worked. It was great. Now it was great as a job because I learned a tremendous amount. It was high paced, high, high pitched, fast paced. Um, it was a great group of singers and performers. 
Um, there's a camaraderie in a show like that that is really hard to equal. And the, the bonding that happens in a crucible like that is really spectacular. And Beach Blanket Babylon's um, Grand Dame was a San Francisco institution named Val Diamond, who's had a voice, has a voice to literally beat the band. I will tell you my favorite Val Diamond story is um, one night the band came in on Val's big number and they were off key. They were like a note off key and Val came in on the right note. Yeah, think about that, right? That's that's real. Val and her husband Steve, oh John Camagnani, Rhonda Robichaud. I made so many friends. There's such a like important part of my young Adam life was at Beach Blanket in Babylon. And they're, the, the the reason it was a huge show in San Francisco and an institution was because it was uh, it was fun and it was funny. It was a great thing to bring your parents to. Also, they had really greased the palms of every concierge in San Francisco, which is how you make something successful. If you were staying at a hotel for a period of time in San Francisco and you said, what should I do? That concierge would tell you to go to Beach Blanket Babylon, where out of that 400 seat house, they grossed millions of dollars a year. It was a fantastic business model. Anyway, the big thing about Beach Blanket Babylon was these over the top, uh, over the top wigs and over the top hats. And when I say over the top, I mean, take what you think of as over the top and go over the top of that and then go over the top once more. Long time members, long time fans of Project Runway will remember the famous season with Chris March. Chris March famously got eliminated and then brought back. He made these giant wigs. He was an incredible designer. He made a gown out of safety pins and Chris was the costume guy at Beach Blanket when I was there. He was an incredible force of nature back then. It was so wonderful to watch him on, on uh, Project Runway. Um, and when I say big hats, I mean hats that were like the size of cars. Val Diamond would come out at the end with a hat that was the city of San Francisco, and it was like eight feet wide. It sat on a, a two inch thick wall aluminum pole that rode in a aluminum frame that sat underneath Val's dress. Actually for their 25th anniversary show at the Opera House, I built five of those hat stands for them, welded aluminum in my little shop with a TIG welder. I was so intrepid. Um, and we're getting now to this beautiful thing, which I recently picked up when a San Francisco prop house decided to auction off a bunch of old things they had. And uh, they listed some pieces from Beach Blanket Babylon. This is a piece of one of the hats from Beach Blanket Babylon. Um, and the maker of all of those hats was one guy uh, whose name happens to be Alan Greenspan. Uh, Alan Greenspan, the hat maker, made all of the hats and props for Beach Blanket Babylon. And he was a preternaturally brilliant maker of stuff on the cheap and on the light. This thing, this weighs less than a pound. I'm gonna say maybe 10 or 11 ounces. Um, and that's mission critical when you're putting stuff on people's heads. I know I said that some of these hats had stands that went into the ground, but many of them didn't. And Alan's ability to build stuff like this. Oh, I forgot to turn it on, hold on. There you go. Christmas lights up in each tower and in the base providing the light. Yeah, this, this gives you a true idea of how Beach Blanket Babylon occurred. And I love this from the sacred to the profane. I love how simple this is. And as you look at the close-ups of this, realize this is just chunks of foam core, two cans of spray paint and some oak tag folder paper. And that's almost it. Like the bang for the buck that Alan got out of foam core still resonates with me because this is not a crazy amount of work. It's not a crazy amount of detail, but every detail he has chosen to do sells and adds complexity to this. So from 10 feet back, it looks way more complex than it does when you're right up close to it, where you see 
oh wow, there's literally nothing going on. Like these are just squares and they're hot glued in. Yes, they are. I love this thing. I find looking at stuff that is this simple and well executed where someone has clearly not wasted one second doing something that wouldn't get seen. It's a whole education in foam core, foam core construction right here. Um, Alan was um, absolutely one of God's own prototypes, unique to himself and an incredible, incredible maker. I, um, the last time I saw him was probably 15 years ago, ran into him uh, downtown outside of, uh, out, outside of Macy's actually on Union Square. Um, it might've been even longer than 15 years ago. It might've been 20 years ago. He knew about the show. He knew about Mythbusters. We were chatting about that. Um, but, uh, and I, did, I never worked for Alan. I never helped him build any of those hats, even though that was sort of my bailiwick. That was, that was not the position I had at the show. And thus I didn't, I didn't contribute to that. But I, admired and still admire Alan's incredible output. And also, you know, I have nothing but fond warmness in my heart for all my Beach Blanket Babylon colleagues. Uh, I learned a lot about the world and life and business working in that job, like you do with any job in your early 20s. All right, uh, I believe I've covered everything I need to cover about this beautiful thing. Thank you guys for joining me for this walk down memory lane with an ancillary show and tell. I will see you next time. Thank you for watching that video. I wanna tell you about our demerit badges because we know that being a maker is a lifelong enterprise of trying new things and learning new skills and it is also about repeatedly messing everything up. And we like to celebrate that because failure is not just an option, it is intrinsic to the creative process. And to that end, we have three new bundles of demerit badges right now on tested-store.com. We've got your shop tool fails demerit badge bundle up here on top. Here in the middle, we have the everyday Day whoops demerit badge bundle. And at the bottom, we've got my favorite, the shit happens demerit badge bundle. You can get any one of these bundles and we are considering offering a bundle of all 24, not those, of all 24 demerit badges we have released, but we're not sure what to call it. You have a suggestion? Put it in the comments.